Far away, I have thick skin and I can take a bit of shit. The UK has some of the worst food in Europe. Where do you think this reputation comes from? Mm -hmm. That's a really tough question because I'm very lucky because... Total how many Michelin stars? In total we've won 18, currently nine. Nah, so... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> please eat the food, it's going cold. Let's do one at a time, shall we, in case I fuck this up. <laughs> Where would you say is the number one foodie destination? Yes. Mr. Ramsey, welcome to Korea and welcome to my channel. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And also, there's something quite magnetic about the buzz in Seoul. And so I love coming here. It's a great honor for me to be sitting here with you today because I am really part of that generation that grew up watching your shows and who thereby came to think of eating and cooking as a, an integral part of human happiness. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that. That's very kind. Thank you. But as any good disciple, uh, instead of bearing gifts, I'm sorry, I come bearing some thorny questions. Yeah, you're far away. I have thick skin and I love thorny questions. Okay, so if you'll allow me, the first question, there is an unfortunate stereotype about food in the UK. The reputation here in Korea and some other parts of the world is that the UK has some of the worst food in Europe. So, where do you think this reputation comes from? Mm -hmm. It's very hard being in Central Europe when you've got France on one side, Spain on the next, Italy in front of you. Mm -hmm. These places, as you know, are 90 minutes, two hours away. So, we never had a great reputation for food. And I go back to being 22 years of age in the middle of Paris working for Guy Savoie. Mm -hmm. And they used to look at me as if I was some piece of dirt. So, all day long I'd peel shallots, turn artichokes, um, and beg to cook fish or cook meat. So, the UK has been desperate to get rid of that brown slurry mess that was not good for our image. The reputation now has gone to the Premier League. There's been such a wonderful multicultural melting pot mm -hmm. of Korean, Chinese, Indian. I think London now is one of the most feistiest, one of the most competitive culinary cities anywhere on the planet. So I think there's a lot of correctness to your question mm -hmm. uh, from two decades ago, but currently now, We've got some of the best Asian restaurants in London, mm -hmm. some of the best fine dining, mm -hmm. and some of the best street food anywhere in the world now. Mm -hmm. So you think that that reputation is outdated? I think it's long outdated. Young chefs like myself mm -hmm. that were 22, 23 years of age, that were fed up with that pragmatic reputation that went out to places like France, Spain, mm -hmm. Italy, you know, from Marco Pierre White uh, to Albert Roux to Nicolas Dennis. You know, all of a sudden we started having one star, two star, three star restaurants and they weren't French. Mm -hmm. And then Marco Pierre White, first ever British chef to gain three stars, I was the second. And so he then schooled these amazing young chefs that went off and did their research development and brought back to this melting pot. So mm -hmm. now, 2023, turn of the century, mm -hmm. there's some amazing restaurants mm -hmm. in London. So there is sort of the flip side to the reputation of the UK having bad food is London being the shining star in the constellation of food destinations. Mm. I find it a little contradictory. Mm. But when I visited London, I found everybody was talking about restaurants and chefs and almost nothing else. So the big topic for conversation was all the time, like, where do you have a reservation for the weekend? Did the chef from this restaurant transfer to the other restaurant or not? What do you think makes Londoners so passionate about yeah. food scene and the restaurants? I'm going to correct you. I don't think we've gone to the very top of the tree. I still think there's room for improvement. I think we, we can see ourselves up there with Paris, New York, Madrid, Copenhagen. We're in that mix now, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not the very top. Where would you say is the number one foodie destination? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, I recently came out of Laos and going back to the provinces and spending time in the countryside, mm -hmm. away from the tourist traps, mm -hmm. the food was just off the charts. Vietnam, extraordinary melting pot of great food. I love food. Vietnam. And so I, 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 I fell in love. There's just such a humble approach to eating incredible food. Mm -hmm. And then Madrid, uh, there's so many exciting things going on in Madrid as well. So I get to challenge my palate by traveling mm -hmm. all over the world and mm -hmm. finding the best locations. But mm -hmm. yeah, Lao. Lao, okay. Beautiful. The whole idea of a celebrity chef basically originated in the UK with you in many ways. Mm. Why do you think it was in the UK that the idea of a celebrity chef started and gained traction? Yeah, I think the UK started focusing on celebrity chefs, both female and male, because mm. we didn't have that foundation. France, they gave birth to haute cuisine. Mm -hmm. In Nonna's in Italy, they were making Anilotti, you know, every bank holiday, every season. Mm -hmm. We brought this culture from the 90s into the, the 21st century. So I think the obsession with celebrity chef was the connect 
to wanting to do better, eat better, mm. feel better. And then the drama of watching a chef cook live, it's like sport, it's addictive. And so you start to understand just what a craft it is and how good it is to cook properly. But I think cooking today for young kids should be as equal as English or maths mm -hmm. or French or geography because they need to know how to look after themselves, mm -hmm. to live well, to eat well, to survive. They need to know how to cook and it's a skill that we should never be scared of. I think uh, learning how to cook, watching your shows in many ways, um, changed my life in a, in a way that's more profound than any geography or history lesson. Thank you. So let's say there's a Korean foodie and they're watching this channel and they say, okay, um, I'm gonna take uh, Mr. Ramsey's advice. I'm gonna go to London and I'm gonna try to suck in all the exciting things about food that's going on in London. Yes. I wanna come back with my stereotype about British food broken and not reinforced. Let's just say there's a person who's willing to go that first step. What would be the tips that you would give him? What mm -hmm. would you tell him so he can have a successful food experience in London mm -hmm. and not come back another yeah. disappointed tourist? So there's boroughs and neighborhoods now mm -hmm. in and around London. So Shoreditch is a very cool place mm -hmm. to be seen. There's phenomenal street food. Mm -hmm. There's tremendous gastro pubs. Um, and there's amazing pop-ups happening every night. There's this sort of melting pot of magic. There's restaurants being built in containers. Mm -hmm. There's restaurants that hold one table of six only and they're doing one sitting and that's it. So mm -hmm. I would suggest that you spend time in that multicultural pot. Mm -hmm. Indian cuisine, for instance, is mm -hmm. one of the nation's favorite dishes. Mm -hmm. Chicken tikka masala, understanding how to blend a fresh gam masala, understanding how to make fresh naan bread, and then even if you're going down to a, a beautiful cottage pie or shepherd's pie, there's something quite unique about how you put the mashed potatoes in there. So seek the real DNA, stay off the tourist trap, mm. and do what I did in Paris at the age of 22, grab all the magic, stick it in your rucksack, and run back to Seoul. Uh, real exciting area, it's Notting Hill. Mm -hmm. It's just a cool, hip vibe, and some of the best Jamaican restaurants to some of the best modern British mm. pubs. There are three neighborhoods that I visit on a weekend. Before, when I was living in Europe, Golden Ramsey restaurants were very upscale. At the time I was 25, didn't have enough money to go to your restaurants, but now you're opening burger joint and pizza joint, and we are sitting in one of your pizza joints right now. Yes. What brings you from the stratosphere of Michelin stars and cooking gods and haute cuisine back down to the land of mere mortals? I'm more comfortable at this level than I am at three star. Celebrated. Really? I mean, you have total how many Michelin stars? In total, we've won 18, currently nine, so. Wow. Uh, <laughs> but you're more comfortable at this level? Well, I think it's to do with my background in terms of growing up on a council estate and having very little food at the table and respecting, watching my mum having three jobs. My children um, have only been to Restaurant Gordon Ramsay once in their life, and that was to celebrate our eldest daughter's birthday at 16. And I can count on one hand how many times I've eaten in my own restaurant in 23 years because I'm more uncomfortable there than I am here. So I think a street pizza and street burger, that was the beginning trajectory of my career, the starting point, going to Northern Italy and understanding the true crust of a Neapolitan pizza, mm -hmm. studying how to blend a beautiful filling for an agnolotti or tortellini. I've been at this now for two and a half decades and I've come back to the beginning of my career to implode on something that I can have fun with, be a little bit more modern, and I think more than anything, I can be reachable as opposed to having to save up once a year to go to a fine dining experience that mm -hmm. all you want to do is go and take photographs of the food and not eat. <laughs> that unfortunately is what some of the people do today. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. That's your prerogative because that's a bugbear for a lot of chefs where they say, please eat the food, it's going cold. But it's a memory they want to capture on that phone. Mm. And so I have no problem with that. And mm. I've welcomed that intrusion from social media because you get the post and the critique there and then. You could be filming and I could be watching your feed and seconds later you're telling me that it's over seasoned, it's not seasoned enough, it's not cooked enough and so I welcome that feedback. Mm -hmm. I've got thick skin, trust mm -hmm. me. <laughs> I can take a bit of shit. You covered a, a huge range from haute cuisine to street food and you were in France, you were in, in the UK and you've opened and operated the restaurants all over the world. And after all that, if you could distill your philosophy about food in one sentence, what in 2022 is good food for Gordon Ramsay? God, that's a really tough question because I'm very lucky because I eat out <laughs> all over the world and so I get excited being this side of the fence. So my philosophy uh, in the current situation is be more appreciative on the importance of breaking bread with family. Mm -hmm. After the horrific pandemic and the world had to stop, we lost loved ones, 
we couldn't get back around the table quick enough to understand the importance of mealtime. Mm -hmm. So no more BS excuses that we're too busy to eat together and the importance of breaking bread for social effect, mental healthness, and just the social awareness of eating together is absolutely critical. Mm. So it's less about the food itself than what food does for it's, human relationship and the society. It's allowing that connect to re-establish the importance of eating well, talking well, mm. and having fun. Thank you for making time to speak to our Korean subscribers. Thank you very much. Yeah, congratulations on the YouTube. And, um, one day I'm going to have as many followers as you. <laughs> Would you um, be comfortable saying goodbye to our subscribers in Korean? I, I, I try my utmost best. And if you can give me a little guidance okay. and uh, coaching. We have a nickname for our subscribers. We call them Gungumi, which means the curious ones. Gungumi. So, Gungumi. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's do one at a time, shall we? In case I fuck this up. Uh -huh. Gungumi. Gungumi. Mm -hmm. 안녕히 계세요. So I'm going to say Gungumi and then pause and you say that again and I'll repeat that after that. Okay? okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ramsey, for agreeing to be to this interview. And we gained a lot of insight into your career and what food means to human life in general. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Um, Gungumi. 안녕히 계세요.